welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So I'm really thrilled to present our guest for today, who I met this summer at the Farmer's Market. He's down at the end of the Farmer's Market on 61st Street, and my kids made sort of a beeline for his place there in the market because it was a truck with a farm in it. Yes, it's Truck Farm. Truck Farm Chicago. And we have co-founder of Truck Farm Chicago here today, Tim Wagner. He's going to talk about Truck Farm Chicago and the work that they do connecting kids to food. And please you join me. Welcome home. by letting you know, I think it's awfully refreshing to show up at school and be served really good food. <laughs> I've been at schools, I've been visiting a lot of schools the last few years, and on more than one occasion, I said, well, like, what's, what are you serving for lunch? Can I sit in the cafeteria with the kids? Usually it's elementary school kids. And on more than one occasion, I've had the teacher and the principal say, oh, no, no. We're not going to serve you any of the food we, we serve the kids. <laughs> Which is sort of ironic because a lot of things I talk about with the kids have to do with food. So the food here was great, but I was sort of surprised that there was no prayer with the Divinity School. <laughs> I grew up in a really Catholic household, and we always started out our dinners with grace. And we thought it was normal and we were doing the right thing, and we never really realized how we were doing it until we had guests over because our grace went to something like this. And if I was one of those good men, let's go to these guests back to you and Chris Little Man. I'll keep going perfectly normal until we had the like, uh, parish priest over for dinner. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and uh, Chef Eli was supposed to be with me, who does some of the um, cooking classes with us. He wasn't able to make it. So it's just me. And I'm going to go through a bunch of slides, which is sort of goes through a story. It's a little biographical. Biographical? Biographical, thank you. If I was sitting down, I probably wouldn't really get that. And then I've got a few questions for you. I promise, 20 slides, less than 10 minutes, or about 10 minutes. So I graduated from school. Got a real job, suit, tie, living the dream, making plenty of dough. I couldn't find any pictures of me in a suit, so I put some pictures of me as, as a kid. I should have been putting pictures up there of me reading books because I used to spend a lot of time on trying to figure out what was going on in the world. And I was really sort of restless figuring out, like, we've got all this poverty, we've got violence, we've got environmental destruction. What should I be doing? I cut the cord just like any crazy person would, no more salary, and I decided to write kids' books and learn more about what was going on, especially what was going on in our schools. And so the books I wrote were about nature and how nature works. And oh, by the way, it's a lot of fun to be outside in nature. Um, and we all ought to be doing it, not only because it makes us happy, but it's, it's good for us. <coughs> While I was doing that, I got an email that changed everything. And it was an email about an opportunity or about an idea to go ahead and go to schools with a big prop, ends up being truck car, and hooking up with kids on food so they understand what they, where it comes from and what they, makes a big difference. So here's a picture of it just uh, a couple of weeks ago. We've got about 30 different plants, fruits and vegetables in the back of the pickup truck. And so we take it to schools and while I'm cool when I show up in an elementary school as a children's book author, I'm like a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I can do no wrong. I can tell awful jokes. And look at this reminds me of um, sort of a winter joke. Two snowmen standing outside. One snowman says to the other, funny, I smell carrots too. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot of bad jokes, but, but people laugh. <laughs> 
Uh, we do a lot of hands-on stuff. And speaking of the carrots, there's one, a couple years ago, a teacher calls up and says, hey, listen, we want you to do this, we're going cooking, and we want to have carrots. And we've got about 100 second and third graders. Can you have 100 carrots in the truck? Well, we don't have 100 carrots in the truck ever because kids are always pulling them out. <laughs> but we drove to City Farm, Division of Clybourne, and we put in, we made space for 100. We pulled up the truck next to the carrot bed, transplanted the carrots in, <laughs> drove to the school two miles away, and the, carrot, the kids are pulling the carrots out. We get close to the end, and one of the kids pulls out, that's a little one, shoves it back in and goes, not done. <laughs> sort of practical stuff, so like the painting of the truck or, or building school gardens. And one thing we've done thousands of is newspaper pots. And we do it because it's hands-on and something the kids can take away with, but it's also because we can ask them about how plants grow. And we've asked kids from kindergarten through college, we take a seed, it grows into a plant. We talk about how it grows into a plant. But where does the mass come from? It's a lot heavier. Seed small, plant big and heavy. Where does that mass come from? I'll give you a, a couple minutes to think about it. We'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> we do a lot of writing. Um, this reminds me of uh, being with some high school girls, West Side, and we're doing food journals. And one of the girls has written down everything she'd eaten in the last three days, and I'm going over it Burger King, and McDonald's, and McDonald's, and KFC, and Burger King, and Burger And so I was talking about it. And one of the other girls looks over the sheet and says, You forgot Subway. Eat fresh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and they all died laughing. We do uh, more writing. We do, sometimes we do cookbooks. And here we are at school, and we walk in, we're talking about something like natural selection and like fall cover crops. And I had just happened to walk into the classroom with a big like leaf of kale, and I'm chopping away at the kale, and one of the kids says, I said, well, I just went for a long run. I want my muscles to be better for the next run. So a couple minutes later, we're out of the truck and we're doing whatever. And the kid says, hey, can I get you some of that kale? <laughs> so I pull off the leaf of kale for him. He's chomping away. Next thing you know, like the whole class is grabbing kale and eating kale. So it is, people say kids don't like eating healthy, but they'll try things, right? Especially when they understand that it impacts their body and it impacts how they do in athletics or how well their brains work for the tests. We do something really fun, um, as you can see, with the blindfolds. And so we're always trying to have them test new foods and different things and then try to guess what they're doing. And one of the things we came up with a couple years ago, so we bring Flaming Hots, we bring McDonald's with us, and, and but we only buy one or two bags of Flaming Hots for the whole year. And the flaming hats stay in the truck and they get really stale. <laughs> so we give them to the kids. The kids think it's, I think it's funnier than the kids think. So this was just, like, yeah, this is a, a video because we're doing, she had never, she'd always hated tomatoes. Yeah. So it's, right, so we talk to kids about like, hey, why would anyone grow their own food or, right? And, and so we get them thinking about food and it's, it's been a lot of fun and I've learned a lot over the last three seasons with it and there are schools and parents that are pushing back and trying to make change. There's one school that we've been to three and a half miles west of here where it's everything from scratch organic and as much local as possible they're trying to hook up with, with local farms and then they're getting their parents involved and they're doing gardens at home and they're doing like wellness stuff and it's really cool. It's neat to see. And I've learned a lot the last few years, in addition to what's going on in schools, but also the local food movement. I've got a picture up here of um, Rick Bayless, who's a, a restaurateur in Chicago that gets 25 bucks for his tacos. <laughs> but it tastes really good. That's his garden. And, and the reason I put it up there, um, because you can grow a lot of food in a small space, but also he's done some innovation, innovative stuff on financing. So he's gone to, to farmers, local farmers, and said, I love your spinach, I love your strawberries, I need more of them for my restaurant. The farmer says, I don't have any dough, I can't get a loan from the bank. Rick says, you know what, I'll give you 10 grand, you expand your hoop house, and then you give me 10 grand of your potato, or you give me 10 grand of your, of your, of your food. But it's more than Chicago. Most of our food doesn't come from Illinois. Very, 
small percentage of it comes from Illinois. So I decided to go on a road trip. Jumped in my powder blue Prius, loaded up on sweet potatoes. I love sweet potatoes, which is one of the reasons why I love your soup today. And then I hit the road. Where'd I go? I went to check out farms. I didn't have to go very far to see what most of the farms in the country look like. Most of the farms are corn, soy, and wheat. Almost all of the acreage that we use for farming in the United States goes towards corn, soy, wheat, and hay. And most of that, that what we grow, goes to animals. It goes to animals and it goes to our cars. And when you put 15,000 cows in a space a little bit bigger than this room, it doesn't really smell very good. And where does the end product end up? Well, it makes some of our food artificially cheap, really cheap, like McDonald's and the, and the fast food joints, and then the processed food, like the, the fat and sugar and the, the few companies that try to get us to eat more and more of it. And what's happened since our food system has gone this way? Well, our health has gotten worse, and it's gotten, it's gotten really expensive. Um, so even if our healthcare system um, were good, <laughs> we're, our health isn't very good. Right, so we spend a lot of money in, in our health. The health of the citizens of the United States isn't very good. And a lot of it has to do with food. And so the big question that I've been wrestling with is, why do we spend billions and billions of dollars of our tax, of why, why does so much of our tax money goes to help the farmers and the companies that benefit from food that doesn't help us work really well and it's not good for jobs, it's not good for air, soil, and water. It uses a lot of fossil fuels. And this was uh, me down in the lobby in, uh, in Springfield. Yeah, that, that I, was, I was a lobbyist for a day, and I met a whole bunch of other folks that were down there at the same time. It just so happened that there was a big group from the corn lobby and the beef lobby. Uh, and I saw this uh, not long ago, and I thought this was really interesting, right? So this is about if we want to improve our health, where do we spend our time and what type of returns do we get on, on that? And I'm up at the top, and that is like the education piece, going to kids and talking to people about food. And hey, if you want better health, you're going to go ahead and make better decisions. And while that's important, the bigger factors, the bigger things, the more bang for our buck would be go ahead and make de facto food, good food, the de facto choice so that we don't have flaming hots and McDonald's on every corner. And what we could do they would be the biggest would change poverty levels and, and income inequality. So things like raising uh, minimum wage or, or maybe democratizing trade policy so that we don't have as many folks that struggle with, with time and struggle with having enough dollars to buy food like that we're eating here today. So not to be all doom and gloom, and this is the, I think this is the second to last slide, there are a ton of great things going on, like the school that I was mentioning, uh, three and a half miles west of here, serving great food and, and getting kids to, to change. There's um, folks that are demanding a higher minimum wage. There are folks that are uh, trying to hold the, the largest corporations accountable. There are co-ops that are more, that have got more democracy in it than, than our traditional food system. There are people that are trying to get money out of politics. Great Lakes pioneers is an event that's happening at actually at Roosevelt University in a couple of weeks, and it's all about solutions and, and figuring out um, how do we overcome the obstacles to create a, a stronger region. So I'm going to end with this, and, and Food Day, ironically, is, is next week. Um, Food Day is a national movement, but Chicago, and Chicago cel celebrates it. I know there's a, a big gathering, there are a couple gatherings, but the biggest is at Daily Plaza next week. Wednesday, next Thursday, rather. So I can end that with with uh, I can end it with uh, with a food day and just while wow, food day is, is next week, I the more I spend learning about food, the more I see food is every day, not only every day, but it's connected to everything. So the decisions that we make and the policies that we have around food impact how many jobs we have. Right, the quality of life we have, our health and our health care costs, military, energy policy, they're all connected. And that's it for, uh, for the slides.
what I wanted to spend a couple minutes on was asking you all some questions, and then maybe we can we can start a discussion around a couple of questions. I mentioned I, I grew up in a Catholic household. I spent 16 years in Catholic school. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> and now I spend a bunch of time like, thinking through questions, like, okay, we've got 12, 7 billion people or so on the earth, and we grow enough food for 12 billion. Why are there so many people, nearly a billion people, that go to, go to bed hungry each night? And why is it that so many of our leaders are Christian leaders and go to church every week, and yet don't do anything to end needless pain and suffering. So I throw that out and kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you expect that answer? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I'm just like going ahead and, and when I met Taryn and I was like, oh, the Divinity School, I'm like, oh, great, because I've been struggling with it for years. And now I get to hear, like, because I... Spend time and I learn this kind of stuff. Well, it's easy. They don't know any better. But the bottom line is they don't know it. They don't know any better. But what I wanted to comment on was yeah. some people say that we are what we are. Yeah. The great philosopher Sophia Loren once said, <laughs> referred to herself, what you see is the result of spaghetti. <laughs> and good genes. Yeah. Maybe it's too big of a question. I'll, 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 go with, I'll go with another one that I was thinking about and just two days ago. It was Columbus Day, and so I was a history major, uh, taking a, and I took a lot of religion classes. Um, but I struggle with the idea of celebrating Columbus, and not necessarily just because maybe of some of the atrocities that happened down where it landed, but really because we've got, and I come from European ancestry, and like the whole, I struggle with like our, our sort of thinking that we're above nature, and a lot of the indigenous folks sort of consider themselves as part of nature. And I'm looking at like, okay, when we, when we look at solutions, and okay, how can seven or eight or nine billion people live well on, on Earth, and I sort of see like the folks that the, the, the way the indigenous folks saw the role of people as making more sense than sort of Western European philosophy where they saw like the Newtonian logic and I remember they saw people outside of nature and above nature and nature to serve human needs. And I, again, as someone who spent a lot of time in Catholic, Catholic school and, and church. Uh, I, I struggle with that. Questions from anyone had any answers? This <laughs> 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 kind of stuff that some of you <laughs> discussed, right? I think I would be more of a god to 7 million people. So if, if that mindset had happened, if, if we stayed, like you say, religious people, we were part of the population. Of 
beef goes up if we have to pay the real price of beef. And yes, the price goes up of if we have to pay for uh, food that's not grown with chemicals, because right now chemicals are less expensive than people and fossil fuels are less expensive than labor. So it's not an easy answer, but I mean the reality is we're paying for it. We're just not paying for it when we check out at the at the grocery line. We're not paying for it when we go into a fast food restaurant. We're paying for it with our tax dollars at higher health care costs. We're paying for it in lower gov lower revenue in the federal government because we have a few companies that are running the food system and they pay as little as in, in possible in taxes and they hire as few people as possible. I was with a regional planning organization a couple days ago and we were talking about food policy and they're working with some of the regional counties like Kane and Cook, uh, or Kane and McHenry and Lake County and talking to them about, all right, you have all this farmland but it's not growing food, it's growing corn, soy, and wheat. Let's show you how much more economic activity you can generate if you promote policies that grow food. So if you have one farm that grows 5,000 acres of corn and soy, there's almost no revenue that comes to that county because it's sold <coughs> to ADM or Cargill and then it go, leaves the state to go feed animals or it's processed in Minnesota or whatever and then it comes back to us something. So there's a whole different <coughs> paradigm if we actually grow, like support policies that grow food for people as opposed to grow food for cars or animals. And so yes, more expensive food causes problems, or the real price of food causes problems for people that don't make enough money. Um, and that, it's not gonna change overnight, but there are a lot of things that are happening on that front, like the protest for a higher minimum wage, like anti-free trade, Agreements. Uh, just like going off that, couldn't it be argued that actually eating local food it, it is cheaper and sometimes than, I mean, you think all, you know, a lot of people can't afford to go to a grocery store and buy healthy organic produce, but am I wrong to say that if you buy it in season, like it's a lot of times cheaper than you might think and it actually is more affordable than people. Uh -huh. think when they think of the North yeah. produce. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And, um, yeah, like when we had a huge tomato harvest this summer, I was buying tomatoes at a pound. Yeah. Right, and making huge fats of, we were with friends, and like, for a while, and everyone comes together and it sort of like builds community. And you're right, it doesn't, it's sort of like people go ahead and say, hey, I don't have, have time to cook, or I don't have the money to buy real fruits and vegetables because of it's so tilted, right? We can get 2,000 calories of garbage with no nutritional value for a dollar, and it's we can get 50 calories of carrots for three bucks. But, like, I, and I brought some apples that I picked last week at a, a farm in Michigan, organic farm, a, a friend of mine, and I got more than 100 pounds of apples for less than 100 bucks. Yeah, it was a pain in the we were to go all the way over there, but it was fun, and we did it with friends, and I've got apples for the next couple of months. And yes, you can grow a bunch of food even in Chicago, like City Farm. Um, and I'm not part of City Farm, but they're friends of mine. They do more than $80,000 of revenue on one acre. Because they're selling their Rick Bayless, and they're selling their Ritz Carlton, and they're selling the fancy joints, but they also sell the local community, you can go up and you can buy seconds for really cheap. So yeah, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. And part of it is priorities and right, how do we get the people to, to care and to shift some of their habits and then also how do we get our leaders in Washington DC or in Springfield or downtown in City Hall to go ahead and start like, seeing, the, seeing the big picture. I think that's a good point in how do you kind of affect the mind change, and especially with children. I mean, I think it's great the place nearby that's doing this organic, natural, homemade thing, but I've heard of a lot of instances where they've tried to make these changes in schools and kids totally revolt. And like, we don't want to eat carrots and they don't want to eat organic meat. They want soft dough and they want hot dogs. Yeah. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, see, yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, they are kids, and so it's kind of like we've 
spend, the fast food industry spends, I don't know, $3 billion alone on marketing. And a big chunk of it is to kids, and a big, bigger chunk of it is to kids in the low-income areas that where parents, right, it's a single-family household, and they're using the TV as a, as a babysitter, and so they see thousands and thousands of ads, and then they couple them with toys, and so they're nagging mom, like, and then mom's coming home, and she's worked two, uh, two jobs, she's making eight bucks, she may not have good cookware, right, and you say, right, like, Martha Stewart will come in and say, make some lentils and put in some, <laughs> and the reality is, it's tough because you're fighting, you're fighting an uphill battle, so it's not, it's not easy, it's not easy, and, and um, it wasn't always this way. And you look at through like the history, and we're like, oh, we had a big farm bill policy change in the early '70s, and that produced extra food, and then we had food consolidation and no antitrust uh, legislation, no antitrust enforcement, and it started in the '80s, and so they just, it's gotten really hard. But to back to your point, like kids, once they eat sugar, like their palate changes, and sugar is in everything, and we're eating so much more sugar. Like they're, they're preying on our evolutionary tendencies <laughs> to love fat and sugar. And then they get us hooked on salt too, so then they put it in, and like the more you eat, the more you want to eat. It doesn't, like sugar, there have been like plenty of studies done recently, and there's this guy, Dr. Robert Rustin, who's all over the globe talking about how sugar is a toxin because it goes ahead and it doesn't tell our brain. If once we get sugar, it doesn't tell our brain to stop eating like, hey, you're full. It's like, and they've done tests, like, okay, we're gonna feed the kids uh, sugar before they go into a restaurant. And then, it, so then in the control group, they didn't feed the kids. And the kids that had already eaten a bunch of sugar ate more at the restaurant than the kids that hadn't eaten beforehand. Hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. I would think that, that the focus of our concern has to be uh, within ourselves. It's a personal responsibility that we have to take to our areas of influence, for example. Uh, we have to make uh, choices for our kids, for our family. Yeah. And that in itself will transform into something, into a network that will be wider. I mean, there's, there's no point saying that the government is at fault or the big corporations are full because you can't change it. You don't have enough money to do that. They have, they have the money, they have the power. But if you change, if you change from the bottom up, if you change people, if you change taste, the palate, because sugar isn't bad. It's the processed sugar that is bad. Yeah. So, I mean, if you change a sugar for another, or if you change uh, the way, instead of using the processed salt, you see salt or something like that, uh, you're not changing, you're not changing the, the actual taste of things. You're just making it better. And then inform your the next generation. What, what you're doing is planting the seeds for the next generation. You won't see big change. You won't see it. We won't see it. But our kids will see it. And that's the hope I like to implant in you that what you're doing is maybe working for the future, not for right now. And it's hopeless now, but it will. <laughs> but it will be hopeful in the future. Well, that's that's the big debate. Is it? And I had a conversation with a friend just the other day who said, hey, listen, I don't want government being part of my, my food. It should be about personal responsibility. And it's like, hey, wait a second. Um, you're about 150 years too late in this whole argument about the government being in our food because we had the government play a role in our food more than 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's become more and more part of our decisions. So government policy impacts the choices that we have at the grocery store, at the restaurant. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So personal responsibility is huge, but why would we have a government working on behalf of companies that get profitable making us sick? By not so, making profitable. By you you are you are gonna be the one. I mean you, I mean the people, I mean not you exactly. <laughs> yeah. You are gonna be the one who will transform it to something that is not profitable. As long as they're profit you won't be able to change it. I mean, that's reality. That's what happened? What happened? I don't know. The I mean, I mean, yeah. There are a lot of people that are changing, that are working on changing the political system. And yeah, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's happened, bef it's happened before. Yeah. And it's going to, I mean, it happened like 50 years ago. We didn't have the government supporting excess food to go to feed animals, to feed a processed food, right? So 
the more like the more and more organizations that are seeing our healthcare bills go through the roof and saying it just doesn't make any sense, and then they connect the dots and they say, well, geez, I don't want it. It doesn't support liberal philosophy. It doesn't support conservative philosophy. Mm -hmm. So there's only one philosophy that it supports, and that is the profits of a, a small number of people companies. Mm -hmm. Um, what what is uh, your work with uh, educating people on how to, how to cook for themselves, and where did that come from? You mentioned you had a chef that you work with. What, can you talk about what kind of work you guys do? Yeah, so like when schools contact us, and then, again, it's largely elementary schools, and they say, hey, we'd love to, we've got a, a unit on food, we've got a unit on health. What type of programming can you offer? And Truck from Chicago is a nonprofit program that's part of Green Sugar Press, which was me and kids' books, and Seven Generations Ahead, a nonprofit out of park that I hooked up with. And one of the programs that we offer is cooking classes, and it's hands-on cooking classes. And Eli Jackson reached out to us a couple years ago and said, listen, I'm from the west side of Chicago. I love the idea of having people, or teaching people about cooking. And we said, great. Come on in, and, and so we brought him into a, a few different schools. And he's fresh out of school; he's actually in graduate school right now at DePaul. I'm one of the reasons why I couldn't come today. But he's a big hit at the high schools that we go to because one, he's not a white kid from the north from the north side like me, and two, he's a lot closer to their age, and so he can go ahead and he talks to these kids about how his grandmother grew food and how his grandmother always had food and was always healthy and never had to go to the doctor. And now how he's making a living and has, right, still in school, but he's got jobs in kitchens making good money because he's been to uh, school and he's making a living doing what he loves and helping people get healthy. And, and he's one of the guys, one of the cooking alternatives we have. We also go to schools with the kids table which is out of Bucktown, and they do hands-on cooking classes for kids. So they've got all the tools, which is helpful. So they've got the mini choppers and the dicers and the slicers and the mixers, and they do this. And so a lot of times it's harvesting from our truck to make kale squash brownies, which I love. <laughs> Those brownies. Yeah. In the meantime, you've got one pickup truck for all of Chicago. Do you have any plans to uh... No, and, and that's what's sort of cool is that we're just one tiny little part, but there are hundreds of other, well, dozens of other organizations <laughs> <laughs> sort of like us. So there are people that say, oh, like, hey, Open Lands is doing this at this school, or Chicago Botanic Garden is doing this over here, or Purple Sparrows is doing this over here. Like, okay, great, you keep doing that. We'll go where you're not already there. So, yeah, like, I, I get it. I'm, like, we're not changing the world. But we're hopefully changing some of the lives or some of the thinking of some of the kids that we're, we're with and having fun while we do it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being accusatory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thousands of pictures. No, no. And, and what's funny is the email I got was from some guys out east. They created their, well, their movie makers, their documentary makers, and they had a movie a few years ago called King Corn. And it makes fun of the food system. And they took a pickup, their pickup truck, their grandfather's mm -hmm. pickup truck around. And they went, did it to a few schools in New York, and it went like it, it worked. So they said, we should have these all over the place. So in fairness to them, we're an offshoot of Truck Farm New York. And now there are a couple of dozen of these all, a couple of dozen of these all over the country. And some of them have been around for years. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sorry. Oh, um, I think it's really great to introduce kids to growing. Yeah. West Virginia, where a lot of people did. And I think getting that habitual and getting people to still set and growing up um, allows change to come from within. Because the system or institutions are composing people who run them or you know, are members of them, even if it's a company. Yeah. Uh, and the people, you know, introducing people with having the capability, the capacity to make the change they want to see in the world is really, I think, a great thing. There are other um, organizations like uh, KM Isaiah, the Episcopal Church here. In, yeah, that's a part of the justice program. Yeah. They grow a lot of food. Yeah. And giving the food away and also having food, you know, teaching kids how to grow, it's just knowing where food comes from is just such an important thing. I think of the movie Evo as well, which people just forget about, you know, um, where food 
food is grown, and when they come back to Earth, you know, they think they can grow a pizza. But they forget that they have to grow the wheat and the tomatoes and all the things that go into it. So yeah. um, keeping us connected with the ground um, and where all our sustenance comes from, I think is really, um, really critical. Um, but in terms of the theory behind the competing limited influence, I think mean, that's a long answer to that question. Um, but I think people here are working on that. Uh, and it's not a, it's not a single response. It's a very right. faceted um, equation. I agree with you. And it's not like I walk I would leave school and I'm all sorts of frustrated, like, hey, oh, I didn't solve the fact that, you know, they they're still like a risk of this these people getting shot as the, as they're going home and they don't have a place to play outside. Because I understand like there's value in just connecting kids and, and right, they rip up a corn plant and, uh, or they rip up our strawberry plant and like my first reaction is no and then I'm like, oh look. What are those who's down here? And they're like, oh, well, those are roofs. <laughs> so yeah, so it's <laughs> right. We may be able to assemble our food one day, but notwithstanding that, I still want to throw into the other. Yeah. No, I, I mean I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to assemble our other food. Like, and Michael Pollan, mm -hmm. who yeah, he gets a lot of great publicity, and he does know a lot. I mean, he said some things like, hey, you know, we've been trying to work on. Developing, we know exactly what's in breast milk, but we can't create a formula that is as healthy as, and we've had 150 years to work on it. We go ahead and we've got all these vitamins, we know exactly what's in a carrot, but we know if we take a vitamin or vitamins that have exactly what's there, it doesn't do the same thing to our, our body. So we're still early on in the understanding of food and how it impacts us. So, I mean, his. So we can that connection, we can't lose that like, connection with our history. Totally, and that's why it's so exciting that there's so much more food growing, being grown in Chicago right now than there was maybe 10 years ago. And there's even one of the biggest plots now in Chicago is there's a, like a 1.8 acre lot now being farmed in Englewood. There's 1.7 just west of Washington Park, so only a mile or two dead west of here, which is kind of cool. We are actually just about out of time, so to my building We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.